You're listening to Clinical Conversations. I'm Joe Elia from the NEJM Group. This is the fourth in a series of four interviews on race and clinical equity. With me is Dr. Joseph Betancourt, an internist and an associate professor of medicine at Harvard. He is also the senior vice president, equity and community health at Massachusetts General Hospital and the founder, senior advisor, and faculty member of the Disparities Solutions Center at Mass General. Welcome, Dr. Betancourt. Thank you so much for having me. Can you tell me a story uh, that illustrates the problem of clinical equity from your standpoint? Uh, yeah, certainly. I mean, I think, you know, and these are uh, common stories and they, uh, I think, are highlighted the most in, in the research. But I think when we consider the issue of clinical equity, what we're, what we're trying to address is making sure that anybody who enters our door, no matter who they are, where they're from, get the best we have to offer. And I believe that, you know, the, the research has highlighted uh, situations, one in particular that, I, that I'd like to talk about that I think is, is pretty clear and, and is very robust, you know, studies showing now in, in, you know, top journals like yours and top journals across the country, that for instance, if two patients present to the emergency room with chest pain, and the only thing different about them is the color of their skin, that uh, the person of color is significantly less likely to be referred for cardiac catheterization, angioplasty, bypass surgery, cardiology, specialist care. And I think, you know, for me as, a, as an internist and someone who's worked in the emergency department and uh, in my training and, and worked in a variety of different areas, I guess as I think about that research experience and I think about stories that, that I've seen with my eyes, you know, uh, my sense is that we as caregivers are very well-intentioned, want to do the right thing, but the more uh, that care is subjective um, and the greater difference there is in culture or understanding between a patient and a provider, um, there's just greater discretion uh, and I think a greater opportunity for you know, stereotypes, misunderstandings, misinterpretations of pain or symptoms. Um, and I'd say, you know, for me in my career, I've seen the, the stories I've seen are not one or two. There have been a lot uh, that, that kind of dock in very well with that research. And, and uh, so, so this is the, the kind of journey we're on around clinical equity is a journey of really making sure that we have the tools and skills we need, that we work within the systems that support high quality care for all. Um, so you're Mass General Senior Vice President for Equity and Community Health. How do those two things intersect, uh, equity and community health? It's a great question. You know, in, in previous, I was just about a year ago, I was Vice President for Equity and Inclusion. Uh, I say that because we have now brought equity and community health together. You know, mm -hmm. for the better part of 20 years that I've been here, we have fundamentally aimed to do several things that we believe are really critical uh, as it relates to equity in clinical care, which is number one, collecting demographics of our patients so that number two, we could monitor our performance. So we've had since 2007, first a dashboard, now an annual report on equity and healthcare quality that looks at a lot of our quality measures, inpatient, outpatient, by race, ethnicity, so we could actually say if we're delivering equitable care or if we're not. And if we're not, we commit to fixing it. And we've, along those lines, developed a series of interventions to address disparities in diabetes, disparities in colorectal cancer screening through coaching programs, navigator programs, and the like. And so I, I guess what I'd say is that this past year and the, the COVID pandemic in particular has really made all of us understand that um, we cannot uh, achieve excellence in clinical care without being attentive to uh, the particulars. And I think a lot of people reference the social determinants, the particulars of what happens in people's communities. And so our approach to bring together equity and community health uh, really tries to highlight the fact that we believe it's critical to have a doorstep to bedside, back to doorstep approach to equity that thinks about the entire care journey. And so this is a, a fairly new and innovative position, only a handful of them around the country at the senior executive level. So I'm excited and we will aim to center equity, uh, patient experience, quality, uh, safety, access, along the entire care continuum from community to ambulatory to inpatient to post-acute and back. So when that patient goes from your clinic to back to their doorstep, they're marching through the, their community. And so how can you advocate for them within their community? Are you reaching out to 
Are you reaching out to the to the municipal drivers of of the of community health? Certainly. So I, I give one example. You know, in, in diabetes, in this office, I could give my patients you know all the right medications to take care of their diabetes. But two things: if they go back to their community and they can't. Uh, you know, exercise, get their heart rate up because it's not safe because they work two jobs because there's no sidewalks. Uh, and if if I encourage them to eat well, yet in their environments, in their communities, there's not access to fresh fruits and vegetables. And if they do, are accessible, they're less fresh and they cost more. You know, we are swimming upstream. And that's what we talk about as we address the social determinants. So what are the types of things we could do in community health in partnership with cities and towns to facilitate those issues? So to advocate for you know, safe uh, public parks and and kind of uh, space where people can get their heart rate up. Or another great example is uh, we're working on a project called Bodega Makeover, which is uh, an opportunity for us to work with bodega owners, small convenience stores in communities of of color, um, to uh, support them to provide healthier options, uh, you know, and put them visible and in the front of their store and to get them priced accordingly. So what does that take? That requires, quite frankly, some partnership from us to help them and some partnership in the community at the sidewalk of that bodega to let them know why those are the healthy choices. So those are the types of collaborations that we need to uh, engage in. And they do need to be community driven, meaning, you know, this isn't a top down from Mass General to the community about what you need to do. It's the community helping us uh, better understand how we can be helpful to them and then finding that sweet spot where, we, where we've been able to do that. And we've been doing that here uh, for over 25 years in a variety of different uh, ways. Now, you, you, um, uh, you had an article in Health Affairs in 2017 on the Disparities Leadership Program. Can you, uh, th- that program is still in effect, is it not? It is, yes. You know, we created that program in uh, 2007. Uh, our idea was, in, in my previous role as head of the Disparity Solutions Center, uh, and, and our work at the Disparity Solutions Center was to work with hospitals, health and health centers to advance you know, uh, efforts in the area of disparities in equity and clinical care. Uh-huh. And uh, so that disparities leadership program really put out a call for leaders from hospitals, health and health centers to come join a collaborative of people who are equally committed. We could uh, share with them what we've learned. They could share with each other what they've learned and they could advance this work. We since 2007, worked with over 100 hospitals in 33 states, about 45 health plans. Um, we had our largest class just this past year. So there's a lot of energy here. And w- what we've learned is that, you know, the one key ingredient is building buy-in and securing buy-in from leaders. So they understand the intersection between equity, quality, safety, value, patient experience, uh, and then building the tactics of collecting data, measuring performance, developing interventions. And we've had great success with a lot of partners. We've learned a lot. We've shared a lot. But our goal, again, was to create a movement, create momentum, and that's what the Disparities Leadership Program aimed to do. Our health affairs article quite simply uh, attempted to delineate what were some of the critical success factors for those organizations that did better than others. And it really was about organizational change management, meaning being very detailed to really change an organization, not just have kind of, um, you know, style over substance, uh, you know, and, and one kind of neat activity, really to be sustained. Uh, now, how the graduates of that program made a difference, and you're allowed to brag about them if you'd like. Oh, yeah. I mean, I think, you know, we're, we're very proud. I mean, I think for us, what we've been able to share and learn, uh, Mass General Hospital received the nation's first uh, American Hospital Association Equity of Care Award. And we're pleased to say that I think at least six or seven of our alumni have gone on to win that award from the American Hospital Association. So very, very proud. Uh, and, you know, we've worked with hospitals uh, as I mentioned, you know, small and large, academic and, and, and community, um, for-profit uh, and certainly non-for-profit, urban, rural. And uh, our, our happiness is fundamentally based on them taking one step forward, making progress in this area in their environments. And so that's, that's what I'm proudest about. But I think from a national recognition standpoint, we're really proud that many of our alumni have gone on to be uh, recognized for their work. Now, at, at, at a personal level, how did you get interested in the problem of, of equity? Yeah, so I'm originally from Puerto Rico. I grew up in a, in a bilingual, bicultural home. I mentioned bodegas. My grandfather uh, you know, owned a bodega in Spanish Harlem in, in New York City. I, I lived in Puerto Rico as a kid. So I've had a ringside seat my entire life to the impact of race, ethnicity, culture, and class uh, on all aspects in society, but certainly in healthcare. And I had the good fortune of 
training in, in a place like Newark, New Jersey, a primarily minority underserved community in New York City, where again, I, I, I lived the, and could eat and breathe the impact of all of these factors and the disparities in, in clinical care and saw the value that I could add as one of a few caregivers of color who understood these factors, perhaps with more lived experience and who wanted to stand up and bring those voices to the change process. And uh, that's been my life's work. It's my passion. It's a, my, my daily work is a dream. It's a dream job. And so, um, so that, uh, you know, I've tried to put my heart and soul into it and, and it's been an incredible journey. And particularly this past year with everything that's transpired, it's been transformational in how much um, both the pandemic and the murder of George Floyd and our national reckoning on racism long overdue has really propelled this work in a, in a new and important direction. Yeah, there's a lot of fuel out there, isn't there, for this? There is. Um, is there a book or, uh, or or a series of articles that you that you um, recommend to people who are interested in, in in this? Yeah, I think one of the foundational books uh, and, and reports in this area is one that I had the pleasure of being part of, and it's now almost you know almost twenty years old. It's the Institute of Medicine report, Unequal Treatment. Uh -huh. um, I you know although it's twenty years old, it's interesting. We the IOM at that point, National Academies of Medicine now really very clearly looked through the evidence and articulated, you know, the key root causes uh, for why we see these disparities in clinical care, why we need to focus on equity in clinical care, and provided a blueprint um, that is as good today as it was back then, because uh, unfortunately, some parts of it have been fulfilled, but a lot of it has been left yet unfulfilled. Yeah. And so I still ask people to look at that, uh, look at those sets of recommendations, because they're, they're, uh, they still remain equally pertinent uh, today as they were uh, back then. Uh, I'd say one other book that, that's, you know, a, a long read, but an important read, and uh, it's, it's written by a, a couple, Michael Bird and Linda Clayton, and, and very unfortunately, Michael Bird just passed away several weeks ago. He was really a legend. They are the preeminent historians of the African-American experience with health and healthcare in the United States. Two volumes called American Health Dilemma. They are Pulitzer Prize nominated. And they really provide the historical perspective of, of how we got to where we are with disparities today. And it's fascinating. And I think if nothing else this past year has taught us the importance of history and better understanding history. So I think those two as companions would be, you know, pretty much um, required reading for me and anybody who's interested in this work. I've been reading Cast, um, which, is, which has been very interesting. Um, yeah. Yeah, I mean, there's there's great books that are more contemporary. Certainly, uh, Ibram Kendi's work is is you know I think very relevant today. Um, Tanasi Coates, uh, you know, there, there's many uh, I, I think that are more kind of lay person um, uh, delineations of of all aspects, you know, race in American society. Now, going to a, an individual level, is there something that you uh, hope uh, or could advise clinicians to do tomorrow uh, that they weren't doing to uh, that they weren't doing today to begin to address inequity. Yep, I, I always talk about three well three things that are quite clinical, and then one that I would just you know hope people would would engage in. I guess and maybe I'll start with that one. Is that I, I do believe we are in a learning profession, and we are in a profession that is committed to high quality care for anyone we see. That's what we stand for. That's why we go into this work. And I think that um, for many years, when people hear disparities, the not me phenomena was very powerful, meaning like, no, I, not me. I'm not part of this. I don't treat my patients differently. And, and I think um, what we want caregivers to understand this. This isn't about good or bad people, intentions or, 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 or no intentions at all. This is just about really understanding that disparities exist and that we need to stand up and, and take action. So it's not about not me. It's about, yes, all of us. And we could all be, we all need to be part of the solution. And I'd say the three kind of clinical pearls that I would encourage caregivers to, to focus on is number one, how can they build their skill set to communicate effectively with patients across cultures? We know that patients bring their social and cultural perspectives to our encounters every day. And how are, are we better able to really understand those social cultural factors and create a care plan that best meets uh, that patient where they are? And of course, you need to be, you need to have curiosity, empathy, or respect to do that well. I'd say number two, there's an incredible amount of evidence on the impact of stereotyping, unconscious bias on our communications and, and clinical decision-making. I would encourage 
caregivers to just really learn more about that because we are not immune. And I think the more you understand how you could be susceptible to making assumptions about patients that impact your care decisions, the better you're able to then mitigate how that might play out in your day to day. So, you know, being aware and, and then being able to, quite frankly, just double check your clinical decision making is very, very important. And I'd end with the third, which is addressing mistrust. You know, mistrust is very potent. It's a trust is an essential part of the therapeutic relationship. And we know that uh, minority patients at much higher rates uh, report that they feel they've been treated unfairly in the healthcare system in the past based on their race, ethnicity, much more concerned in the future about being treated unfairly in the healthcare system based on their race, ethnicity. In so much as we can build trust, uh, I think um, that goes a long way in, in addressing these disparities. And it's not easy, but by simply, you know, I, I tell my caregiver friends, just, uh, you know, when, you, when you're engaging a patient, so, you know, I, I know a lot of patients have a bad experience, have bad experiences with the healthcare system. You know, is, is that the case with you or, or is that, has that been an issue for you? And what you're doing there is you're giving them an opportunity to say, well, you know, yeah, I did have this bad experience. And what that opens the door for is you to say, I'm sorry, I can't explain why that happened, but I want to be different. And I hope you can trust me. Um, You know, that small intervention, and it might maybe take a little bit longer than you'd like, maybe be a 10 minute conversation, will be an incredible investment in in your relationship going forward. Uh, Well, Dr. Joseph Bettengore, I want to thank you very much for your time with me today. Thank you. I enjoyed it. And I wish everybody um, the best of luck and and hope we could all join in creating a more equitable uh, healthcare system together.